Welcome everyone to the National Arts Club at Home. On behalf of the National Arts Club and the Roundtable Committee, we welcome you. My name is Rhoda Ellison Hirsch. I am a member of the National Arts Club Board of Governors and the Roundtable Committee. The National Arts Club is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. We offer more than 150 free programs to the public, including art exhibitions, music and dance performances, lectures, and readings. Visit us at thenationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my honor today to introduce Dr. Michael Matzas in conversation with Marsha Ikonopoulos. Miss Ikonopoulos is one of the world's leading experts in Greek Jewry. She is the museum director of the New York City landmark, Kahila Kadosha Yanina, a Romaniot Greek synagogue. Marsha has published journal articles on the history and culture of Greek Jewry and is a much sought after national and international speaker. Her soon to be published book, Meet Me on the Corner of Broom and Allen, is the story of Romaniot Greek speaking Jews in New York. Marsha enters in conversation today with Dr. Michael Matzas, author of The Illusion of Safety. This illuminating and riveting book presents through impeccable research, including official government wartime reports, the little known history of the Holocaust in Greece, personal memoirs of Holocaust survivors and Greek resistance fighters, and Dr. Matz's own personal experience. When Dr. Matzas was 13 years old, he and his immediate family hid in the partisan-controlled Free Greek Mountains and survived. Tragically, by the end of World War II, it was learned that 87% of the Greek Jewish community was destroyed. Why were so many lives lost? This conversation will provide new insight into the Holocaust, the Nazi misinformation machine, information hidden by the Allies, Greek history during World War II, and importantly, the significant role of Greece in the Nazi defeat. The book is a compelling and fascinating read and may be purchased from our preferred independent bookseller, Books on Call NYC, and also on Amazon. Links will shortly be posted in the chat box. Following the conversation will be a question and answer period, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. And now we are privileged and honored to welcome Michael Matzas and Marsha Ikonopoulos. Uh, Dr. Hirsch, I want to thank you very much for the beautiful occasion you gave me to be with you here today. And I know that you organized all that, and I thank you. Roder, I would like to thank you also. And um, as museum director of Kelakadosa Yanana, a synagogue that you are well aware of, your own family being of Greek Jewish background, the Kochamero family, founding family of our synagogue, Roman Yo Jews, very briefly, 2,300 years of continuous Jewish presence on the soil of what is now Greece. Uh, the longest continuous Jewish presence in the European diaspora, simply thought of as Greek-speaking Jews, and were there a good 500 years before the Sephardim came. Michael is going to cover all of Greek Jewry, telling us about what happened to Greek Jews during the Holocaust, very often the orphan child of Holocaust studies. If I can start out the questions, Michael, it's so good seeing you. I have to say that I know Michael now for over a quarter of a century, which is making me feel very old, but I had the privilege of introducing him initially with his book when it came out in 1997 at an event through Sephardic House. I called it my personal Bible because Michael wrote about things that nobody else was writing about and educated me along the way. Michael, if I can start out, 
Tell us about your life before you went to the mountains. Uh, dear Marcia, I want to thank you for the, your promotion of uh, Greek Jewish history and culture. Thank you. I was born in Ioannina in 1930, and my father was an employee of the National Bank of Greece. When I was five, my father was transferred to Arta, where my sister was born. We left behind 126 plus relatives who were eventually killed by the Germans. I did not know them that well. My sister did not know them at all. But my parents' deep pain, which they tried to hide from their children, remained with them until the last day of their lives. In 1940, my father was transferred to Agrinu, where there were only 40 Jews. On October 28, 1940, Italy attacked Greece. The Greek army defeated the Italians and occupied one third of Albania and remained there in the snowy mountains until April. Germany wanted to attack Russia, but they could not attack Russia before conquering Greece. So on April 6th, the Germans attacked Greece. The pro-German Greek generals capitulated. The Greek soldiers returned to their homes. Germany created three zones of occupation, Bulgarian, German, and Italian. We were in the Italian zone of occupation. In 1941, on June 22nd, 1941, Germany attacked Russia. The military attaché of the American embassy in Berlin, because America had diplomatic relations with Germany until December of 1941. So he immediately reported that in any city the Germans occupied in Russia, the first thing they did was to kill all the Jews. And all this information was going even to the American newspapers. Now, in 1941 and 1942, there was famine in Thessaloniki, where there were 56,000 Jews. At that time, everyone was going from Thessaloniki to mountains, uh, to mountains or any place where they could exchange uh, clothing, jewelry, anything that precious they had to buy uh, food be before they were starving. If the Greek Jews knew this simple thing that the American Jews knew, that the Germans were killing the Jews where they found, and we were already occupied by the Germans, well, we did not know anything because our, our only source, reliable source of information was the BBC of London. Every night, we were following at eight o'clock what came from BBC. For the entire war, BBC never mentioned even one word about the Jews. So in, in March of 1943, we heard that some Jews were deported from, from Thessaloniki to Poland. We heard that the Germans told them that the Poles, who were already dead, by the way, by that time, they were with open arms ready to, to accept them and give them housing, jobs. And at the very end, they said, by the way, take with you your jewelry and your gold because you might need it in order to have a better life in Poland. And finally, the deceitful Germans said, in Poland, they don't have drachmas, they have zlotis. So you should go to this bank and exchange drachmas for, for uh, uh, Sotis. In uh, going back to Agrinio, we, my, my father bought a, a horse load of wheat. The villager came and he said, in this bag, there is a gun and ammunition for your friend, Christos Bokoros, who was one of the leaders of the resistance. My father immediately put the gun and the ammunition in a basket and he told me, go from the back seats. He put some other items in the basket. I was an enthusiastic 13-year-old, 
And I went through the main street and I even touched an enemy soldier as I was passing him. In September of 1943, Italy capitulated. So the Italians left and the Germans arrived. The Germans were very polite. They didn't bother anybody. But we, the Jews of Agrinium, decided that we were not going to obey any anti-Jewish German regulations and we would go to the mountains. We put in waterproof bags any supplies that we needed. My father arranged to get a vacation from the bank at a moment's notice. We gave supplies to our friends, including supplies in his bank, but we remained in the comfort of our homes. What made you decide to actually go to the mountains? That's a good question. A Jewish merchant went to Athens to buy merchandise. He found three big Jewish shops closed. He came immediately back to tell us that. Jonas, a teacher, said, and a member of the resistance, by the way, said, this is not a good sign. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to the mountains. Everybody said, we will do the same. My father did not know what to do. He contacted the Bokoros to whom I gave the gun. He, who was also a leader of the resistance, said, bring your supplies and come immediately to my home. We did. The next day, a taxi was right in front of the door. We put our luggage inside and we left the city. After 25 miles, the road ended. It was a beautiful mountain road moving around. There was the, uh, the village of Huni. There we rented two horses and a donkey, and after three hours of hiking in a beautiful forest, we arrived at the picturesque village of Psilobrakos. There we rented a room, and we started what we thought was a wonderful vacation. How did you survive in the mountains? Well, uh, this vacation was a little different than any other vacation, but the, my mother learned from the village women what she should know in order to survive there. My mother, in turn, taught them how to do embroidery and how to make dresses. And in this way, the, the villagers were all organized by the resistance, and they, everyone was doing something according to his to his capacity. Uh, eventually, our so-called beautiful vacation ended temporarily when the, the resistance told us that a big German force left Agrinion and is coming in our direction. We organized for you to go to the most remote uh, village, excuse me, remote house in the mountain. And we took a donkey with a villager. We put a few supplies there and we climbed to the top of the mountain. There, the villagers said, in case of need, I'm going to show you a cave that is there in which you can, uh, we, we visited the cave, it had beautiful stalactites and stalagmites, and this is a memento from 1943. In six days, the Germans returned to Agrinio and we returned to our normal life. But at the end of March, yes, at the, at the end of March, my mother said, we don't have enough food here. I'm going to go to Agrinio to, to, to get food. My father and I said, this is extremely dangerous. Nobody, no villager was going anymore to the city. Well, I should say that we managed to send one villager who did get food that he brought to us including the information that two days after we left, two Germans went to the bank and, uh, and wanted to see my father. They told him that he was on vacation. So my, my mother did not listen to anybody, went by herself to the city, and after some adventures that are in the book, she returned back after three days, totally exhausted and very depressed. And she said, Right now, in the city of Adrenion, all the Jews of Ioannina, Arta, and Trebizor are in a, in a warehouse. Our hunger was immense, and not only against the Germans, but against the Jewish leaders and 
even our own relatives whom my father begged to do what we did. And they were telling us, you should come to Ioannina where the Germans are extremely nice and don't, don't bother anybody. Anyhow, my father said, there's, there's still hope. The next day we went to a village called Prianza where there was a British military mission there. And my mother talked with a very kind British major and he immediately said, I'm sending a radio message to London. In Prianza, we realized that this was a place where the, the British planes were coming and were, were dropping by with parachutes, weapons, ammunition, uniforms, even gold British coins to, to help the resistance of Elas. That was the left-wing resistance of Elas. Most of the resistance was left. And uh, we, there was also right-wing resistance in Ioannina and a first cousin of my father who was a physician with the right-wing uh, uh, resistance. So my mother thought that the next day we could become beggars and go from house to house and collect uh, uh, parachute material. She, she, her plan was to make from these parachutes uh, dresses and shirts that, that we could sell for food after the harvest. So we went back to the village and there again, the village women taught my mother how to make a special pie by which we could feel filled, we wouldn't be hungry. So every day I was going with a knife and I was getting done, done, done the lines and with uh, mixed with olive oil and flour, we could make this pie, so we were not hungry. Then a group of partisans arrived in the village, very idealistic people. And when we told them we needed food, they said I could go there every day in line and get the portion of one partisan. We divided that into four parts, since we were four people, and that preserved our food supplies until harvest. When the harvest came, we managed to get, by going to wealthier villages, to get all the food we needed for the next year. Time passed, and by September, the Germans left Greece. And we said goodbye to all the villages who helped us, and we, well, that's about it. We, all, all those who helped us, we thank them. We came to the city of Adrini. There, I realized that this year in the mountains was not wasted. There I learned the most important lesson of my life, and that was how to live a meaningful life. So at this point, I decided that what happened to us was of historic value. And I wrote a manuscript called The One Year in the Mountains. My father read the, the, the manuscript and he saw how much I loved the partisans and their songs, and he wanted to protect me. He created a hiding place under a heavy dining room table. He explained to me, after the war, the collaborators of the Germans in coordination with the Greek police that cooperated with the Germans in the arrest of the Jews and the courts, they were persecuting everyone who uh, 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 who fought the Germans. So in the school, the, my teachers decided that I shouldn't lose a year and they put me back with my classmates. In 1948, I went to Athens and I wanted to become a dentist. I passed an examination where there were uh, 820 candidates for 30 positions. I came number 17. By 1953, I was a dentist. I had to serve in the Greek army for three years. I decided I was going to learn English. I knew French and Italian, but I didn't know any English. I learned English by myself. The army liked me and they put me in the highest position for a reserve officer. And that was the dentist of the military academy of Athens. By 1956, I was accepted by Georgetown University Dental School. The dean was a, an admiral of the of the American Navy and uh, on, as a postgraduate student. I studied for four years 
living on one dollar a day. And then uh, I, I started uh, teaching and practicing dentistry. I opened my own office. My sister came to America in 1959. My parents came in 1963, and they, they remained here. Michael, to step back one, uh, was that manuscript that you wrote about your year in the mountains, was that ever published? Uh, well, it, it was not published. It remained in the table. And, uh, and uh, well, but I, I remember they asked me in the Holocaust Museum, they asked me, did I remember, did I feel bad about it? I said, I did not feel bad because I remembered everything. And I put it in the book. That, that was a good question. When did you decide to write the book, The Illusion of Safety? Well, when I came to America, I liked to, to find out what was known about the Greek Jews. There was very little or nothing. Uh, and, and even there was anything, it was not accurate. So I, I tried to, first of all, find uh, material from, the, from Greek sources. Then I found out that the deportations in Greece started in March 1944, yes, March 1944, when the, after the Warsaw Uprising, as a matter of fact, the commander, the German commander who destroyed the Jews of Poland, he was sent to Athens to destroy us. The deportation started in March 1944, and they did not end even when they, they arrested the Jews of Rhodes, in July 20th, 1944. And even then, they hadn't finished. I became very upset, furious, because it looked to me as if the Jews were waiting in their homes, in their cities, their turn to be captured by the Germans, the most civilized nation in the world, and killed. So. I went to the American archives and I found there some 500 pages of uh, related to the Jews of Greece. In your research in the American archives, what documents impressed you the most? Well, I can say one thing. After I studied them, I felt very bad because I loved both Roosevelt and Winston Churchill. Now, the document that I found first was one related to the Jews of Corfu. It was sent by the uh, American consul Burton Berry of Istanbul. And this is the document. And I found it uh, under the classification, classification of top secret. Top secret, I repeat that. My, that means they didn't want anybody to see that. And my question to them is, who was the enemy, the Germans or the Jews of Corfu? So this is the, the document. Michael Boyajol, a merchant, was traveling by train from Athens to Istanbul. On April 30, 1944, he met three SS German officers. He was fluent in German. They told him that they were going to Corfu to deport the Jews. They left the train in Larissa. That document arrived in, in America in, in the State Department in, on May the 2nd. Now, if they wanted to help the Jews, they could very easily send a message to the British military mission next to Corfu. The British, through the resistance, they could notify the Jews. They had 38 days before the message received and before the Jews of Corfu were arrested on June 9, 1944. Plenty of days for the Jews of Corfu to disperse themselves in the big, the big island of Corfu in many, many mountain villages. But this was not done. Now, in another book, by a Greek professor, Anne Pekidis, who did research in the American, excuse me, in the German archives. He, I found something amazing. I found a story about the only good 
German officer in all the books that I read. And that was Colonel Emil Zegger, the commander of the German troops in Corfu. These wonderful men tried to prevent the deportation of the Jews from Corfu. He sent a lengthy report to Berlin, which is in, the, in its entirety in my book. Among what he uh, wrote in that, in that message was this. Why not transfer the Italians who as former soldiers are much more dangerous than the Jews against whom, by the way, we never expressed any complaint. The Jews against whom, by the way, we never expressed any complaint. Now, what uh, happened with him is something that my beloved daughter Linda, who is right here next to me, found a few days ago. She, she just wanted, was curious to see what happened to this good German, the only good German I know. And, and this is what he, she told me, that he was demoted from colonel to a major. They put him as a commander of a German battalion, infantry battalion. They sent him to Albania, where there were also partisans. The partisans, I don't know what they did to the battalion, but they captured him and they executed him. So something good about the Corfu is this. Prince Philip, husband of Queen Elizabeth, was a Greek. He was born in the palace Mon Repo in Corfu. His mother was Princess Amalia, Princess Amalia, a Greek princess. She saved a Greek Jewish family in her home in Athens. And she's honored by Yad Vashem as a, 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 as a righteous among the nations. Princess Alice. Um, what prompted you to publish the second edition of the book in 2021? That's a very good question. From 19, my, all my books from 19, 1997 were sold out. And in the meantime, out of habit, I collected some 60 pages of new material. But the most important thing was I read many books and I found two very important books. First one is Professor Richard Brightman's under the title Official Secrets. What the Nazis planned, what the British and Americans knew. And he writes in 330 pages now book. The British broke the German code of the German order police that dealt with the Jews in September 1939. I mean, September 1939. The Allies knew everything the Germans were doing to the Jews. And I will give you a small example. For example, they say about a city, there were so many Jews in the city, the German commanders so and so with so many troops arrested them and took them to such and such a place where they were killed. So, yes, that, that, that was it. I have a personal question to ask you. The other book, can I tell you about the other book? Oh, certainly, of course. The other book was by Professor David Wyman, titled The Abandonment of the Jews, published in 2007, an American author. He wrote, the United States and Great Britain were deeply committed in a policy of not rescuing the Jews. Antisemitism was widespread and the State Department was actively blocking information about the genocide and deliberately obstructed rescue efforts. A fact that particularly pains me as a Christian is that the American churches were largely silent. Now, in, in 20, 2020, the Hondrinos published a book in Greek. And he says the following about my friend, Prime Minister of England, Winston Churchill. 
he found a letter by Winston Churchill in the National Archives of England. Churchill wrote, perhaps it is preferable for us if the Greek Jews, rich or poor, remain in the hands of the Germans. In America, John Pelle, director of the War Refugee Board, accused the State Department for keeping information about the Holocaust from the American people. Officials of the Treasury Department exposed this dirty scandal, as they called it, in a report under the title, A Quiescence of this Government in the Murder of the Jews of Europe. A Quiescence of this Government in the Murder of the Jews of Europe. The head of this government was President Roosevelt. His great-grandson decided to become a rabbi. Rabbi Joshua Bettinger wrote about his famous ancestor. If he knew about the slaughter of the Jews in Europe and he did not act, that is very serious, inexcusable. I repeat, inexcusable. And now I want to, to go a little bit deeper into, into history. According to the historian Ladislas Farago, Hitler of Germany decided to attack Russia in October of 1940. He believed that he could conquer Moscow and Russia just as easily as he conquered Paris and France, but he could not attack Russia before conquering Greece first, because that was in his back. Now, this is what the German Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel said, because the, the, if, if the Italians had conquered Greece, then the Germans would be free to attack Russia from November of 1940 till June 22nd, 1941, when they actually uh, attacked. So he said, the unbelievable strong resistance of the Greeks delayed by two or more vital months the German attack against Russia. If we did not have this long delay, the outcome of the war would have been different in the Eastern Front and in the war in general. He believes that thanks to this delay, the Germans were defeated in front of Moscow while they were fighting the Russians. By the way, thanks to the delay, they even had great Siberian troops with them and the best general of the Second World War, Dr. Dr. General Zhukov. They were defeated, the Germans were defeated because the, it was in sub-freezing weather and they were still dressed in summer uniforms. They were dressed in summer uniforms. Now, two Greek historians, attribute the Greek victory to Colonel Mordochai Frizis, a Greek Jew. And they published two books, and this is what they say about Colonel Frizis. Colonel, Colonel Frizis, prior to the war, he was stationed, by the way, in the Albanian frontier, and he understood by seeing the increase in troops, Italian troops in Albania, that Italy was going to attack Greece. So he developed a plan of expulsion of the enemy that he submitted to the chief of the, of the Greek army, General Papagos. General Papagos approved it. So when Italy attacked and the Greek army retreated in panic, the forces of Colonel Frizis implemented their plan. They, they defeated the Italians in the sector that was theirs. They uh, captured 700 Italian prisoners, killed the commander of the, of the uh, um, uh, division, Julia, and he entered Albania. This made the Greek army to regain its enthusiasm and counterattack and push the, the, the Italians all the way to the mountains of Albania until April. So this, now this is what the Greek historian Anastopoulos wrote in his book. Frizis executed a tremendous counterattack without which the victory of 1940 would not have been realized. 
the Greek historian Simopoulos wrote, the honor of the most, the honor of the most glorious victory in the entire front belongs to the military tactics of Colonel Frizis. Colonel Frizis was killed in the front line on his horse, leading his troops. He, he was, he was, he was black. My father, my first cousin of my father, was a master. The Greek prime minister, a fascist, honored him with statues and warm condolences to his family. The, the American professor, and well-known historian, Dr. Stephen Bowman. After he read the book, he told me, you made a fantastic contribution to the Jewish people. And I'm going to finish with some remarks so that I can. Number one, conditions in Greece were such that most of the Greek Jews would have saved themselves over 30,000 Greek Jews, former soldiers of the Greek army, could have preferred to die fighting in the Greek countryside, protecting the Jews. If the Jews had dispersed, like I said before, to remote Greek villagers, even without weapons, with their own knives, they could kill all the Greek traitors who would like to betray Jews because there wasn't any serious Greek resistance in 1941 and 1942, while the Jews were allowed to go to the mountains. In the Battle of Karalaka on May 6, 1944, the 242 Germans were killed after they captured five Jewish families near Mount Olympus. The Greek losses were 14, 11 Christians and three Jews. There is a monument there honoring these people. Harold Alexander, commander of the Allied forces in the Mediterranean, sent the most, uh, the greatest decorations to the battalion commander of Elas, uh, Antonis Angeloulis, who, who led in this, in this battle. Second, the a, a military ranking officer who, who contributed the most in the defeat of, Ger of Germany as an individual, I'm not talking as a general, but as an individual was Colonel Mordechai Frizis. The Greeks to this day are extremely proud of what Frizis did, but thanks to their antisemitism, the Greek governments never mentioned him from 1945 until 2002. I thank you very much. Michael, do you want me to put up the pictures for you to talk about? Yes, please. Okay. I will say what is in every picture. Okay. This is Colonel Mordechai Frizis. This is the monument in Corfu, Holocaust Memorial in Corfu. A Greek Jew told me this was the only one that was not vandalized in out places in, in Greece. This is the house where we live. You can see stones belong to a museum, particularly a stone with a bird. Now the, the village is totally abandoned. This is a German photograph. And the young lady that has the, up, the hand up in arms is the only survivor of all these people. And she is the aunt of Dr. Alex Levis, who is a consultant to the Pentagon with uh, the rank of three star general here in Washington. This is a German plane shut down by ground fire. Among the people who were shooting were these two Jews, Jewish partisans of the last. 
I'm going to take the next question for those who are unfamiliar with the history. Can you give some statistics and details about the deportation of Greek Jews and their fate in the camp? In 19, with the start of the occupation, of Greece in 1941, there were approximately 76,000 Jews in Greece if you count the islands of Rhodes and Coast. 87% yes. of Greek Jews perished in the Holocaust. 87%. Right. In the city of Salonika, where there was the majority of Jews, uh, of those 76,000, 56,000 lived in Salonika. These were mostly Spanish speaking Sephardic Jews, and 97% perished from Salonika. Uh, the, I wrote a paper, if you want to access uh, Kehila Kadosha Yanada's website, on the stories behind the numbers, because there were certain things that are never discussed, and that's what happened when they got to the camps. You're talking about people that came from a environment, the climate was very different from that in Poland. They were used to drinking water. If you drank water in the camps, you died of typhus. Uh, in addition to the long journey they took, that was longer than Jews coming from most other countries. I mean, they spent an average of seven days in those cattle cars. When they arrived at the camp, the decision of who was fit to go into the camp, the majority of them were sent directly to the gas chambers. So may, there's I, a whole... may I interrupt you? Of course. I, I wanted to say something that with, the, with the, their silence, the allies benefited the enemy, the Germans, both yes. financially and militarily, because yes. instead of only 650 Jewish partisans, there could be thousands of them. About financially, I will tell you what happened in Ioannina. In Ioannina, a, 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 an officer arrived with a hydroplane. His name was Kurt Waldheim. Yeah. His job was to collect from the Jews of Ioannina their gold and their jewelry. And a first, you know, second cousin of mine, Josha Smatsas, looked at him and he hit him with a baton. He looked at him a second time, he hit him again. He escaped and he became a partisan. Then he went to Israel. When he saw who was a candidate for president of Austria, he recognized immediately this SOB, the criminal, Kurt Waldheim. A great turmoil took place. Many journalists went to Israel to interview him. A Swiss man decided to pay all the expenses to bring the, my cousin to New York. He got so excited, even I got excited talking about it, talking about the things. I am very sorry. I, I, I was supposed, to, I thought I was stronger than that. He died with a heart attack. Kurt Waldheim became Secretary General of the United Nations and president of Austria. That shows you so much about German criminals. M Marcia uh, and Michael, I'm sorry, but we're gonna have to uh, close the conversation quite soon. Um, I just want to uh, uh, make a comment that uh, it's documented that Eleanor Roosevelt knew what was happening to the Jews in Europe early on, and uh, she pressured FDR, and of course it had no effect. Uh, there were people in this country who knew what was happening in Germany, uh, and it, it's a tragedy, it's part of the whole tragedy. Um, I uh, also um, uh, was hoping to uh, just mention that if people read the Michael's book, uh, you'll find the irony of what happened to many of the Greek resistance fighters who fought against the Nazis and, uh, and successfully so. And afterwards, uh, there was a, would you call it a civil war in Greece? Uh, the Greek government's trying to stand on its feet. And uh, many of these uh, partisans who fought the Nazis were arrested and uh, killed. It's a very complicated story, which I don't think we really have time for now. But I was wondering, Marsha, if we can end this um, uh, with a comment on uh, what happened to the Jews of Zankathos. Um, yes. and, um, and before uh, you do that, I just have to thank the both of you for this enlightening, and poignant uh, discussion, and Michael for opening your heart and um, and sharing with us uh, your personal commentaries on these uh, 
facts. And um, I, I urge the audience to please read this book. It, it practically reads like a novel. It's all based on facts and uh, commentary of memoirs. Uh, it's um, it's one of the most incredible reads on uh, the Holocaust and gives many new perspectives. Um, yeah. Marsha, can you end on, you know, would you care to please end on that okay. note? I, I'll make it short and I wanna say this is something that Michael and I have argued about. Uh, the official story of the saving of Jews of Zappenthos is that when confronted uh, and asked for a list of the Jews, the mayor, uh, Lucas Kadeat went to the Metropolitan Bishop Christosimos, and Christosimos presented the head of the German occupation forces on the island of um, Zakynthos with a list with only two names, his and that of the mayor. Uh, according to eyewitness accounts of those who were Jews in the city, they were then went into the mountains, they were saved by the Christian population, and the simple fact is the Gestapo never arrived on the island of Zappenthos and without the Gestapo, there could not have been a deportation. While at the same time, in the same period, Jews from Corfu were rounded up and sent to, uh, to the camps. So the question arises, according to the biographer of uh, Metropolitan Bishop Christostomos, Christostomos was German speaking. He had studied in German. He was able to communicate with German headquarters and actually spoke to Hitler and pleaded for the Jews of the island. We have not been able to substantiate that particular conversation. I've gone through German archives. I've reached out everywhere I could. But the simple fact is all the Jews of Zappato survived. And uh, I know Michael will argue with me, but... Um, there's no other logical explanation other than the conversation that took place between the bishop and uh, the head of German command pleading for the Jews of the island. Uh, right. Dino, Dino Seder, who is on this uh, uh, presentation here, wrote an excellent book on the miracle of Zapathos. And uh, I sent to him papers that I had translated from the biography of Christostomos. I, thank you. Thank you, Marsha. And thank you, Michael. And I'd like to remind everyone that uh, Michael uh, Matz's book can be purchased at Books on Call NYC and on Amazon and also on the Kihila Kadosha Yanana website. And if any of you missed any part of this conversation or wish to have others see it, in a day or so, the complete event recording may be found on YouTube at the National Arts Club. If you are interested in becoming a member of the National Arts Club, contact us at admissions at the nationalartsclub.org for more information. And again, a heartfelt big thank you to Marsha and Michael Massas and to all of you. Good night, everyone. Good night. I thank you very much.